record. Okay. So yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, another Sharks for Kids uh, webinar series. Uh, we're really excited to expand on not just sharks, but other um, ocean issues, marine life, um, and just kind of things that are happening in the natural world, ways to get involved. And today I'm really excited to be hosting uh, Jewel Benaby, who works with the Bahamas National Trust. I've been lucky enough to work with Jewel on some shark education programs, visiting schools, um, and she's doing amazing work uh, for various parts of the environment. I feel like you're bonefish and then mangrove, you're, you're doing a lot. So uh, I know you guys at Bahamas National Trust are very, very busy and working on a lot of projects. Um, so Jewel is an environmental scientist and project manager at the Bahamas National Trust, working with various ecosystems and a wide range of species. But her favorite is the coastal environment. I don't blame you. Um, and today she's going to talk to you about coastal ecosystems and restoration for the future. So um, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we have disabled the chat. Uh, so if you have questions, which we love, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I may answer some as we go, but I will save them uh, and ask Jewel at the end. Um, so please put them in there as you go along, as they come up, uh, and we will get to as many of those as we can at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you take over and kind of disappear for a little bit and, and let you do your thing. So thank you again for joining us and sharing this with us today. Hi everyone, uh, Jillian was so kind enough to do a wonderful introduction for me, but like she said, I'm an environmental scientist. I live in Grand Bahama, um, in the Bahamas. And like she said, I work for the Bahamas National Trust. I'm really, really happy to be here doing this talk with you guys. Thank you, Jillian, for inviting me. Um, and my topic today is on coastal ecosystems, restoration for the future. Coastal ecosystems are special areas of interest for me specifically, um, as they are very unique environments where many of my favorite fish, marine mammals, sea turtles, birds, uh, they all can be found in, in these ecosystems. And here in the corner here, there's a photo of me in Mukaya National Park, located in Freeport, Grand Bahama, where I'm collecting data on mangrove seedlings within the park. Post Hurricane Dorian, as you all may be aware of the impacts of that storm, we suffered a great loss to a, our mangrove forest. And it is our effort to attempt to restore this ecosystem, um, which I will go into further detail as the presentation um, goes forward. So my objectives for today are to describe different types of coastal ecosystems. Also, I want to highlight the role of sharks um, and their role that they play in coral reef ecosystems. And I'll speak some more about um, the main threats and how you can get involved in restoration. All right, so do you enjoy going to the beach, snorkeling or swimming? How about field trips to the national parks? like Bonefish Pond National Park in New Providence or Westside National Park in Andros. How about exploring coastal forests? Well, I wanna share with you some cool facts about these ecosystems that you may or may not be aware of. So firstly, before we go into it, I wanna make sure we're on the same page um, and I wanna define what an ecosystem is. An ecosystem is a community or a group of living organisms that live in and interact with each other and in a specific environment. So an ecosystem is a community of living organisms um, that are in conjunction with non-living components in their environment. So they, they're interacting all together as a system. So these biotic, which is living, living things are interacting with abiotic, um, factors, so non-living things like weather or earth or sun and soil and climate. Um, and they are all linked together um, through nutrient cycles and energy flows. So if you look on the screen, you see three different marine organisms and they are all working together and interacting together in the coral reef, if you follow the arrow, in the coral reef 
ecosystem. So also ecosystems can be as large as a, as a forest or large scale like the entire ocean, or it could be as small as a puddle of water. And next, I wanna make sure we're on the same page with what the definition is of um, coastal ecosystems. So coastal ecosystems are both and along both along and close to the marine shoreline. So in general, they are the areas where the land and the sea come together. So at the top, you would see a sandy seashore ecosystem. And the bottom, you've probably seen these cropped roots and know that they are red mangroves, which is a type of mangrove that is always closest to the water. Now, there are many different types of ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, depending on where you are in the world. There are seagrass meadows, salt marshes. Um, there are white land coppice or black land coppice. There are coral reefs, as you can see in the bottom there. There's kelp forests, sand dunes, rocky intertidals, as well as mangroves. And in the interest of time, I won't get into all of them, even though I can go on and on about each ecosystem and their relevance. But just for today, we will stick to just going over three of them. And the first one we will talk about is the coast, sorry, is the coral reef ecosystem. And the coral reef ecosystem is an underwater ecosystem and it's characterized by reef building coral. And reefs are formed um, of colonies of coral polyps, and they are held together by calcium carbonate. So most coral reefs are built from stony corals, whose polyps cluster in groups. Um, coral reefs are found in various parts of the world. At, uh, sorry, various parts of the ocean. <laughs> However, the biggest coral reefs are thousands of years old, and they're usually thrive in very shallow, warm water and where they receive lots and lots of sunlight. As you can see from the video, coral reefs are home to numerous species of fish, um, corals, sponges, seahorses, lobsters, sea turtles, and of course, sharks. All of these species play a very, very important role in keeping the ecosystem in balance um, and especially sharks. They are one of the most important Important species as they, as they keep the whole system healthy. These reefs provide critical habitat and rich feeding grounds for a wealth of marine species and they are and they also help to buffer coastlines from severe storms and flooding. So they have a very big job. Um, I'd also like to take it a step further and talk about sharks on reefs. Now, sharks are critical for the health of our ocean systems, like I said earlier, and specifically coral reefs. They keep the whole system in balance and without them, we won't have many of the key species um, and species like, that we like to eat, like snappers and groupers. Um, the diversity of species within the ocean will fail to thrive if sharks are removed from the picture. So sharks keep order in the food chain essentially, and they are commonly misunderstood because of popular culture um, and often negative imagery that we get from the media sometimes as they're portrayed as vicious creatures. However, in the world, the world is changing um, and we are learning more and more about how much they do for us and how much more we can do for them. According to National Geographic's report in 2013, humans kill about 100 million sharks annually, and they are threatened because of poor fishing practice. So they're often caught as bycatch, which means that they are not targeted species from those vessels, and they are often drowned by those nets. Now, they are also fished in some parts of the world. However, in the Bahamas, sharks um, have 
sharks are protected and they are, and we have a shark sanctuary in country, which means that there will be no um, fishing of them or hunting of them because it is indeed illegal. So having said all that, as I continue my talk today, I'll just shed light on how we can preserve and protect these ecosystems as sharks are a part of some of them. Next up, we have the white land coppice um, and native trees, native trees and plants that are found in our Bahamian forest is known as um, coppice. Jack Patterson, who is the author of Native Trees of the Bahamas, estimates that there are probably 100 species of trees and shrubs per square mile in our Bahamian forest. Um, there are different types of coppice, coppice throughout our Bahamas um, and on islands where coppice occurs, each forest is slightly different depending on its location. The amount of rainfall, and if people are using the area would depend on if the, that type of um, forest is, is seen. Places that we will walk alongside the road or drive in our referred to as the bush. <laughs> to the white land coppice. Um, we know that the white land coppice is, um, we, we will know the white land coppice because it's often in very close proximity to the sea. And the trees that you may see here would be mahogany, uh, sea grape that we have in the upper cor corner here, cinnacords, gumbo limbo, and et cetera. Um, this white land coppice is the preferred habitat for species like land crabs and a diverse species of birds and the Bahamian iguanas. Also, lastly, we have well, my third um, ecosystem that I want to talk about is the mangrove ecosystem. And mangroves are tropical coastal plants that are adapted to wet soil, salt water, and they are periodically used to being submerged by tides. Um, mangroves are important species as well for humans um, and as well as various other types of species. They provide nursery grounds for fish. Some species of sharks really love mangroves like the lemon sharks. Um, and this is because they use this area to find food. And also many of them give birth to their young in um, the roots, under the roots of the mangrove forest. Mangroves also are important because they help to stabilize our coastline. So they prevent flooding, um, erosion, and they also absorb strong uh, storm surge impacts. Um, like we had Hurricane Dorian, many of our mangrove forests would have been heavily impacted by those strong winds and strong um, waves from that storm. So essentially they, act, they are on the front line of defense protecting us from storms. And now that we understand each of these ecosystems, um, let's briefly talk about how they are threatened and how we can all help. Now, the first ecosystem that I wanna talk about that is definitely threatened would be the coral reefs. Coral reefs are threatened by overfishing. Um, or the fishing of juveniles, marine debris like plastic bags and plastic debris and pollution. Also, touching corals when you're on a dive is actually a threat to them. Um, and then also severe storms. Even killing sharks are a threat to healthy coral reefs. Next up, we have the white land coppice. And this environment is definitely threatened by development and the um, just uh, development of the coast and pollution, as you can see down in the corner here, dumping of any kind is very, very bad for this environment. As you can see, tires and plastic bottles and any sort of marine debris may wash up onto the shore and um, not just impact this um, 
beach area, but also flow into the coppice, white land coppice forest. Another major threat to white land coppice would also be invasive and alien species. So what do I mean by that? I mean species that are not typically found in a specific area that can outcompete um, native species for resources. So for example, in this short clip down here, you would see that I am walking through this um, white land coppice area and it is actually riddled with casuarina. Um, or better known as Australian pine. And these are definitely a threat to this environment, like I said, because they do outcompete with um, the native plants of that area. Thirdly, um, the mangroves. The mangroves are threatened by a myriad of different factors. Um, and those factors include, like I said earlier, development, any sort of destroying of the mangroves definitely impact how much they can be helping, not just us, but the biodiversity at large. Um, the mangrove ecosystem is also threatened by pollution. So we have here just an example, um, plastic and marine debris, nets and all of that definitely can smother or choke this ecosystem, um, various parts of this ecosystem, as well as the biodiversity that will be living there. So whether it's birds that may be living on the roots of this mangroves forest or in the water where there would be fish and other marine life. Another thing that may be threatening our mangrove ecosystems would be roads. Sometimes roads are run in between ecosystems and eventually the area that is cut off from the water supply ends up drying up and actually can die out. Another big threat to mangroves would be hurricanes. So like I said earlier in the presentation, Hurricane Dorian was the latest and a supreme um, severe and um, super storm of sorts that impacted our northern Bahamas, that's Grand Bahama and Abaco specifically, and it is estimated that about 70% of our mangrove forest that is located in the eastern portion of the island would have been directly and severely impacted by that storm, and in Abaco about 40% of the mangrove forests would have been directly impacted and destroyed from that storm. So super storms like Hurricane Dorian definitely pose a major, major threat to the healthy, the healthy thriving um, of our mangrove forests. Now, the BNT is currently working on a rewilding campaign to collect native plant seeds and grow and repopulate our white land coppice and mangrove forests on Grand Bahama, Abaco, Andrus, and eventually we will work towards um, rewilding our other islands as well. We are hosting volunteer days um, and that is where we we're not only just cleaning up our environment, but we're also working to remove invasive species like uh, casuarinas and scavola and any other invasives that would be found along our coast um, from our national parks. And then we're also training the public on best practices for these removals. You can easily get involved and be a part of this work by spreading the word to your family members on everything that you've learned here today. And you can come out and volunteer with us and be good stewards of the environment by never leaving trash behind and becoming a member of either a Discovery Club or the Bahamas National Trust in general. All right, so I think I will open up the floor for questions. All right, well, thank you so much um, for all that really informative, um, uh, just the information about it. I know here we definitely have a lot of Australian pines here in Bimini. They're everywhere and 
there's been big campaigns to cut them down and get rid of them and they just keep coming back. Um, and it's really interesting because there's a place on on South Germany, and you may have seen this, that they are they were along the edge uh, mm -hmm. and they're next to some mangroves and uh, the mangroves hold strong, but because of a storm, the Australian pines have now tipped over and mm -hmm. their roots are just up in the air and it's sort of just a mess, but it shows you that a much smaller plant, the mangrove, is there and these massive trees uh, couldn't couldn't stand up to a storm um right. and it's yeah it's like i love it because it's the perfect image to show just how important they are and how strong they are so um yes yeah and i i think mangroves just don't get the credit they deserve such an amazing ecosystem uh, beautiful but also extremely valuable so um the first question is um one that I always like to ask, and it's really easy for some people, hard for others. Uh, do you have a favorite species of shark? And what is it? Well, it may be a tie. <laughs> it may be a tie. And I, I wanna say lemon sharks, um, just because they hang out in mangroves a lot. And that's where I've seen, I, was that one of the first sharks I've seen? maybe i think so and then i would say tiger sharks because that was one of the first sharks that i tagged when i was an intern at the um, bimini biological field station actually doing this sh at the shark lab i was able to tag a tiger shark and that was the first one that i did and it was a huge shark and that was really exciting for me so that was definitely a close tie with the lemon shark. <laughs> yeah, and for you guys, let me see if I can lean. So the right behind me is this is a lovely little lemon shark in the mangroves. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so both amazing species, um, you know, very lucky here in the Bahamas to have such a diverse population of, of sharks and these ecosystems. All right, Barbara would like to know, um, what is the most invasive species causing harm to this area? Well, you've covered a few, but maybe, you know, if you want to pick one or a couple that are, um, yeah, you think are, are probably the most important to try and get rid of, um, or you're seeing the most impact from. So that's a great question. There are, it depends on which ecosystem you're with, you're in, but along beaches, along, um, where there would be coastal coppice forests, um, white line coppice. Uh, I would say the Australian pine is definitely a top contender um, just because the way it chokes out its competition. So it grows pretty big um, and it will shade out all of the understory plants. And, and it, when the needles fall down onto the floor, it actually creates these sorts of mats um, and if you go on the beach and they're there, you'll see that it's completely brown and you can't see the sand where, where the underneath that tree. And that is a way for the plant to outcompete natives. And also another very interesting part of this is that it's not just the way the plant um, would, would drop its needles, but also the seeds, those little pine cones, each of them will bury into the sand or blow down the shoreline. And then there would be another tree, literally. So it becomes very difficult to, to manage. So just last month at Mukaya National Park, we had a volunteer day where we were focused on tagging and removing invasive species. And specifically the casuarina pine was one of them. There's been efforts to remove them before. However, we were revisiting that area and um, we pulled up about maybe more than 200 little seedlings off of the beach. And I actually just went there out yesterday and I was walking that same area and I noticed that there were more. Mind you, it wasn't to the amount that I saw a month ago. However, it just shows how they can just thrive in foreign environments. Yeah, it's it's in, it's crazy to see how well they've taken. Um, obviously, you know, doing very well and just yeah, it's it's really hard to to get rid of them, as you know, because it's just there's nothing natural that's stopping them. So you're relying on, and the problem, from my understanding, was man-made. Like they, they were brought here, they were spread from dropped from places, and to kind yeah. of <laughs> help. And it, you know, it really obviously wasn't uh, a yeah. help. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's really. 
No, definitely, definitely. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you got started kind of working in this field? Uh, was it something that you were interested in when you were younger or kind of developed as you got older? Or yeah, can you tell us a little bit how you got started? Yeah, so I I grew up what you know, growing up in the islands, you're always near the coast. You can you can always access the beach very easily. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to, you know, in my family, my dad, my mom, specifically my dad, always pushed for us to go to the beach almost seemingly weekly, <laughs> depending on the um, the semester that we were in. And I was able to just kind of fall in love with with the coastal environment and that's kind of where it all started i just going to the beach and exploring and and look digging in the sand or or a snorkeling and stuff like that and that kind of garnered that appreciation for the environment and um that's where it was birthed and then i was able to go off to school and study environmental science and biology and i volunteered and i interned in multiple places and you know it that, that was my story. That was my startup. Very cool. Um, do you have of these ecosystems you talked about, or maybe there's another one, do you have one that's a favorite, um, one that you, you know, prefer to, if you could work in that one most of the time, um, is there one that you prefer? I am so biased. I prefer being in the water for sure. <laughs> For sure, but because um, I'm a science officer in Grand Bahama, um, I definitely work in the terrestrial environment as well. But anytime that I can be in the water, anytime it, if it's snorkeling or scuba diving or just doing um, surveys or, or um, measuring, uh, what do you call it, slopes on the sand, that's all fun too. So I think just anything with the water, marine. <laughs> Yeah, I, I get that. It's just, um, it's beautiful. And the Bahamas is, is definitely a really special place with incredible ecosystems, both on land and underwater. But I have to say, I think, yeah, definitely the underwater world is, um, there's something really magical around here and just all the marine life. And, um, cool. So you talked a little bit about um, what people can do uh, and, you know, ways to help. But what is, if there was one piece of advice for kids, um, what would you say? What, because a lot of times, and we have a lot of students, and I, I believe we have quite a few discovery clubs watching, um, is that what's one thing, because it can seem overwhelming, there's so much happening, and there's so many challenges for the environment and different animals, but what would you tell kids? What's one thing that they could do to really make a difference for maybe one ecosystem in particular, all of them, um, you know, in their daily life? What, what can they do? Well, I would say it's it's kind of two part because one learning about the environment creates an awareness for the environment. So definitely paying attention and asking questions. Um, anytime that there's talks like this or you're in a science class or on a field trip, ask as many questions. Uh, don't No question is a silly question. Um, continuously um, be inquisitive of the environment never stop learning in that way. And that creates that awareness and also a sense of pride for the environment around you. So it starts with learning and asking good questions, well, asking questions in general. Um, but also I would say, um, I would say another way to get involved would be to volunteer when you can. And as a kid, you, you can do that. Uh, even as an adult, you can do that. It's, it's nothing really stopping us from giving back to communities and um, just being a part in that way. So you can volunteer with the Bahamas National Trust or other environmental organizations. And I promise you, if you're anything like me, <laughs> once you start volunteering, you won't stop because you will see just how important the work that you are doing in your community is. And it gives you a sense of pride. So it's a two-way tie. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think we're going to finish with one more, and it's a bit of advice. Um, so if there's a student watching, uh, you've obviously mentioned volunteering. So that's, I'm assuming, part of this. But if they're interested in pursuing or following a, a, a similar path, 
um, to working maybe for Bahamas National Trust in the future or a similar organization, similar field. What are um, some pieces of advice uh, that you would offer some of the students watching, whether, you know, we've, I assume we have a range of ages, but uh, yeah, what would you, what you would you tell them to kind of do or suggest uh, if they wanted to, you know, they're interested in pursuing a similar path? Yeah, so that's a great question. So beyond just volunteering, you can enter into an internship. So which means that there's a specific um, set of things that you will learn and be able to do with an organization. And like I said, you can do this with the Bahamas National Trust as well as other environmental organizations. So going into an internship would give you skills and um, exposure that can really, really, really propel you into your career in the future. Whether you're in primary school, middle school, or high school, or whatever level of education you are at, um, interning is an amazing way to learn more, do more for your community, and make a bigger impact. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think just getting that hands-on experience, it really helps you gain skills and knowledge that will then help your career. Um, or maybe you'll get to try something different that you didn't know you were interested in or a skill that might be really valuable that you didn't think of. So yeah, um, and I, yeah, I think it's really valuable, particularly in, in the science fields. Um, and it's a lot of fun. You can meet really great similar, you know, people with similar passions and interests. So uh, yeah, great way to network. So, well, thank you so much, um, Jewel. I really appreciate your time. And this was very informative. And we did have uh, Alina Winter say this was very informative. So thank you. Uh, yeah. And for those of you, if you caught part of it or want to watch it again, it will be on our Sharks for Kids YouTube channel um, shortly, hopefully depending on my internet. Um, and yeah, make sure to stay tuned for more webinars, but thank you again. Um, we'll also have, you know, make sure you check out the Bahamas National Trust, uh, the pieces of advice that Jewel offered, ways to get involved with them, depending on which island you're on. Lots of amazing opportunities. Um, I know we love collaborating with you guys, and thank you so much for everybody who joined us, and thank you so much, Jewel, for, for sharing all of this with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Thanks, thank Jillian. You. Thank you.